Over 60 years ago, America's greatest archaeologist, William Foxwell Albright, proclaimed to the world the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in so doing, he made an amazing claim that these are the greatest discovery of modern times. How can one make such an amazing claim? Well, there are five reasons. Number one, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the land of Israel itself. For Jews and Christians, there is but one holy land. You may love America, you may love Canada, you may love Europe, but for Jews and Christians, this is the land where the prophets preached. This is the land where Jesus walked. For all of us here tonight, if you were to have one holy land, one pilgrimage, it would be to the land of Israel. May I ask for your hands up, who's been to the Holy Land? Isn't that wonderful? 50% or more of the audience. Who will be going to the Holy Land? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that glorious? My friends, not 15 miles from Jerusalem, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Number two, they are written in the languages of the Bible. You know, anyone who's serious about the Bible, they need to learn the languages of Scripture. And of course, the Old Testament to Hebrew Bible is written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. So, uh, people who are serious about the Scriptures study the language. If you want to know if a college or seminary or university is serious about the Bible, check out how much Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek they offer. Even pastors, even a church. Why not get into the language that Jesus spoke, the languages of Scripture? This is essential reading. Here we have documents written in the very languages of Scripture. We had almost nothing in Hebrew going back 2,000 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls. Number three, the Dead Sea Scrolls contain the oldest Bible manuscripts in the world. I have such wonder to share with you tonight. I will demonstrate to you that the Dead Sea Scrolls are more than a thousand years older than the oldest Hebrew manuscripts. That for people who study the Bible, these are essential reading. These are very, very important. Number four, the Dead Sea Scrolls give us new information on early Judaism. Jews are excited about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here are the only documents that were written while the temple still stood. Did you know that? We have virtually nothing that survives from about uh, the, the turn of the era. Everything was destroyed. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they were so old that even scholars did not believe it. Jews are excited about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some years ago, the President of the United States visited Israel. I believe it was in 2007 or 2008. And the Israelis said, we have a problem. How do we honor the President of the United States? At that time, it was President Bush. How do we honor the president of the greatest and strongest country in the world? What the Israelis did was they brought him to the shrine of the book and they brought out the great Isaiah scroll that had been in storage and not shown for over 40 years. The one you see is a replica. They, they brought out the great Isaiah scroll and they said, Mr. President, we give you Israel's greatest honor. That's how Israel honors the President of the United States. And in fact, now the Israelis have said the Dead Sea Scrolls are the greatest cultural treasure of Israel. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, number five, give us stunning new information on early Christianity. Christians, too, are excited about the Dead Sea Scrolls. This, these scrolls validate many of the beliefs we have about Yeshua, about the New Testament, about the Gospels. I will unpack for you tonight 
some amazing scrolls. I will show you some scrolls that give us the very words of Jesus a hundred years before Jesus. How's that? My friends, I submit to you for these five reasons. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the greatest find of our time. These are even bigger than the Super Bowl. Amen. I need to alert you that the Dead Sea Scrolls have been shown at museums across North America. Wherever they are shown, the numbers exceed expectations. I even have a hit parade. I have a top 10, but I won't show that to you tonight through lack of time. But did you know that wherever the Dead Sea Scrolls are shown, they break the records? We are speaking near Seattle. Some years ago, 2007, they had an exhibit, and many of you went to see it. 222,000 people came. 222,000 people came. Um, just a, then we had the recession, and everything collapsed. And did you know that after the recession, the scrolls were brought to Toronto in Canada? And the idea was to cheer up the whole continent of North America. Would people lift up their eyes and see the glory? And people were very worried. Would people even go to museums after the recession? Well, 300 and 30,000 people came. Wherever I've been to the museums, all over America and Canada, the organizers are amazed. One of them said to me, it's like a Rolling Stones concert. <laughs> I kid you not, tonight I'll even show you a scroll that is like a Rolling Stones sensation. I'll show it to you. I just need to tell you, the next exhibit is coming uh, to Texas. And, and uh, Southwestern Seminary has bought, they've purchased seven small Dead Sea Scrolls. A huge exhibit is coming, and this will be the, the talk of, of, of Jews and Christians all across America from July to January. And of course, I'm involved in the exhibit, and I'm going to tell these, dead, these guys in Texas, the question is, my friends, not are the Dead Sea Scrolls big enough for Texas, is Texas big enough for the Dead Sea Scrolls? I'm going to challenge them to break the record. Now, I realize many of you know some about the scrolls, but I should give you a very brief introduction. Let us take a journey tonight to a place called Qumran. Like a ribbon on the eastern sky stands the holy city of Jerusalem, and we are journeying to see the Dead Sea Scrolls. We come to an amazing landmark in the middle of the desert, sea level. Think about that. We are proceeding beneath the level of the sea to the lowest spot on the face of this earth, the Dead Sea. Seven times saltier than the oceans of the world. In 1946 now, we think it is, a shepherd boy threw a stone into a rock, and he heard the sound of breaking pottery. Muhammad the wolf on the right had made the greatest discovery of our time, the Dead Sea Scrolls, because in these jars were found precious manuscripts, including the great Isaiah scroll. What a sensation. You'll hear more about that tonight. This man, Eliezer Sukhanik, believed that God had sent him to bring the, the Dead Sea Scrolls back to the Jewish people. He realized early on that here was the lost heritage of Israel. He made it his life's mission to secure these first Dead Sea Scrolls at a very dangerous and volatile time. There's a very famous date, November the 29th, 1947, Sukhanik travels to Bethlehem, which was divided, it was, it was separated from the rest of Israel by barbed wire, um, and he secured three scrolls for the Hebrew University. Does anybody know why that date is also very famous? That's the day when the United Nations voted for Israel to become a country. For Jews, the Dead Sea Scrolls are not just interesting, they are a passion and a love 
and part of their identity. What about the other scrolls? They took a different journey, such as the war scroll. They were sold to a man called Kando in Bethlehem, who was a, a Syrian Christian, and he gave them to his bishop. And the bishop had a problem on his hands. What do I do with Dead Sea Scrolls? What would you do in the church or in a congregation? What do you do with precious uh, manuscripts? Well, the bishop thought, I will sell them and raise money for my church. That's honorable. But he was a smart bishop. He knew that the big bucks were not in Israel. They were not in Egypt. He knew there's only one country where the big money is, and that is America. He took the four scrolls. He came to the United States, and he took out an ad in Wedford, the Wall Street Journal. This is a genuine ad. Four Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical manuscripts for sale, 200 BC, an ideal gift to an educational institutional group. These were the other four scrolls that Sukhanik had never managed to purchase. He had died, but his son, the great Israel general and archaeologist, Yigal Yadin, was lecturing in America, and when he saw the ad, he knew exactly what they were. And through a middleman, and through very delicate negotiations, he was able to purchase them from the bishop. On June the 15th, 1954, Yadin secured the remaining four scrolls for the State of Israel. They are now housed in a museum called the Shrine of the Book, which all of you will see on your trip. It is a must-see. This is the only museum in the world designed for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Look at that. A, a, a white roof on the left and a black granite slab on the right to symbolize the struggle between light and darkness, good and evil. And even the roof is unique. To, to resemble one of the Qumran jars. Now what about other scrolls? We need to mention other scrolls. Uh, a lot of scrolls were found in cave four. This was the mother load. This was the treasure trove. In this cave, nearly 700 manuscripts were found. The oldest Bible manuscripts in the world and stunning new documents telling us of early Judaism and Christianity. They've been cleared out now, of course, but my friends, there was power in these scrolls found in this room. And uh, here's one of them, the commentary on Hosea, the first Bible commentaries ever written. Yes, they invented Bible commentaries at Qumran. And these have been housed for many years at the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem, they were recently moved to the campus of the Israel Museum. Now, I have so much to tell you, <clears throat> and yet I have to be brief. When we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, we talk about the caves, we talk also about a site called Qumran. Near the caves was an archaeological site, and scholars believe that this site had something to do with the scrolls and the caves. I will tell you a bit more about that later on. Suffice it to say that this one room is the most important. This was called the scriptorium. This is the room where scrolls were copied. We have not only the room, we have the desks at which they sat. The scribes of 2,000 years ago and even three inkwells have been recovered. The very means of production of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only site in Israel where you have the settlement and the documents, the only one that remains. The non-biblical scrolls. <clears throat> when we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, we divide them into two groups, the non-biblical scrolls and the biblical scrolls, which is very easy, of course, so let me focus on these just for a moment. I'm going to show you in the second half that these non-biblical scrolls are stunning. Remember, these ones were unknown for 2,000 years. These are the lost scrolls we didn't even know about. We'd never seen them. We don't know what they were. Here is a document 
that, that, that talks about a messianic son of God. Wow. wow. Here, is a, here is a mikvah that is related to the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I will explain that to you. There's a connection between that and John the Baptist. And so that's coming after the break. Now, um, I'm going to talk now about the biblical scrolls. I can really speak for two hours tonight, but I'm going to be considerate and, and, and not go on too long. So I'm watching the time. But every time I speak about this, people say, Dr. Flint, why did you stop? You'll see. You're going to love it tonight. The biblical scrolls. My friends, we have the oldest biblical manuscripts in the world. You see, when we are Bible professors, we do not presume that the Torah just existed or that the King James was used by Paul. Or, or that the Bible was there. We want evidence. Well, we have multiple copies of Genesis. We have um, in the Paleo script, the, the Paleo Levit Leviticus scroll from KV11. What a wonderful scroll. We have Genesis, we've got Leviticus, we've got multiple copies of these books. By the way, am I speaking too fast? You see, you've got to stop me. This is exciting stuff. But I don't want to happen what happened to me some years ago. I was speaking in Arizona, and at the end, this one lady said to me, Dr. Flynn, that was a wonderful talk, but I don't understand what are these Dead Sea squirrels. <clears throat> the Deuteronomy scroll. This scroll you see before you now is a sensation. This is the oldest copy of the Ten Commandments in the world. Listen up. The Dead Sea Scrolls right now are on exhibit in New York. They're bringing this manuscript, I believe, for two weeks. When the, when the Deuteronomy Scroll was brought to Toronto just for one week, because it is so precious, the queues were around the block. It was more than a Rolling Stones concert. My friend, these are sensational. Here we have the oldest evidence by centuries of the traditions we hold dear. The Psalm scroll from cave 11. I, I did my PhD on the book of Psalms. What a wonderful and exciting field. Isaiah, um, um, I've worked with Isaiah extensively. I'll share some of that tonight. And even Greek. There were Greek scrolls at Qumran. This is actually from Nachal Cheva. There were Greek scrolls. The scrolls actually show us that Jesus and the Jews of his time spoke Greek. They spoke Greek as well as Hebrew. And that's when Jesus was with Pontius Pilate. They were speaking in Greek. It was like the English of that time. Now, <clears throat> what about the top ten? I, I must show you this. David Letterman is not the only one to have a top ten. Right, uh, when we take this, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and we ask what were the favorite books, this is very important, you can tell a lot about a congregation or a person by the books they read. Is that not so? And so what were the ten top books at Qumran? And the numbers keep changing. These are new figures, including recent acquisitions uh, that I've been mentioning to you. Well, first of all, Number uh, 10, Jeremiah, seven scrolls. There were seven copies of Jeremiah. Number nine, the Minor Prophets, and number nine, joint uh, numbers. So we have a joint situation, the Minor Prophets and numbers. You see what I'm doing? I'm counting the number of books. And as you know, the Minor Prophets in the Hebrew Bible is one book. Okay, we go down. <clears throat> number seven. Daniel, 10 manuscripts. That's a lot for such a small book. 10 manuscripts, a very important book at Qumran. Number six, Leviticus, 17 scrolls. Number five, the book of Exodus, 19. Let's just stop there a moment. So folks, we're getting now a profile of the shape of the Bible at Qumran. Let's put it that way. These were the books that they found very interesting. Right, are you ready now for the top four? Because the stakes are high. Number four, we have the book of Isaiah, one of the most important books at Qumran.
They love the book of Isaiah, and we hope to speak more about that later on. Uh, number three, the book of Genesis. Genesis used to be in spot number four, but now with new scrolls that have come to light, Genesis has just overtaken Isaiah. So this is very interesting. The idea is that some scrolls have been not discovered recently, but they've come onto the market recently, including the ones coming to South Western Seminary that I mentioned. So that's why the numbers keep changing. Now, uh, let's talk about the top two books at Qumran. Um, this, is, this is neck and neck. Number, number two, Deuteronomy. Why Deuteronomy? This is very, very interesting. And the top book at all, of all, number one, the book of Psalms. My friends, those were the top books at Qumran. Now you might say, well, you know, doesn't everybody just like the same books? I don't have time to do a rundown, but let me now take Rabbinic Judaism. Let's take the Mishnah. We cannot count the scrolls in the Mishnah, but we can count the number of times they quote the Bible, right? When we take the Mishnah side by side with that chart, this is what we get. And of course, I could spend a long time on this. We have Ezekiel, Minor Prophets, Proverbs, Isaiah. And it's not surprising if you talk to a rabbi and say to him, Rabbi, what are your favorite books? He would say the Torah, right? So if you look there, we have the Torah and the book of Psalms. That is not a surprise. The Torah and the book of Psalms. And in the Torah, uh, we go down Genesis, Psalms, we get Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 234 quotations. And the book that is quoted the most in the Mishnah is Leviticus. Very, very interesting. You see, Rabbinic Judaism is concerned about halakha and cultic purity and matters of observance. And if you contrast that with Qumran, Psalms and Isaiah are much higher. There was like a different profile going on there. They were also interested in halakha and ritual and cultic observance at Qumran, but there was something else. And I'm going to show you one more slide that may be helpful to contrast. And there it is, the New Testament. Again, I don't have time to unpack this. I used to give a whole lecture just up to this point. And it is very exciting if you do the, ten, the countdown one by one. But in the New Testament, the books that are quoted are very different. The Proverbs, Jeremiah, counting down. Daniel, Leviticus. See, Leviticus is not so important in the New Testament. The Minor Prophets, Genesis, Exodus, and here again, Deuteronomy is very high, and Isaiah and the Psalms. This is very interesting, my friends. But there's a reason I submit to you that the Psalms and Deuteronomy and Isaiah, these were very important books at Qumran and for the early Christians. But let me, let me just move on to ask another question. You see, when you take the Hebrew Bible, every book in the Hebrew Bible is attested at Qumran except for one. There was one book not found at Qumran. Anyone like to guess? Esther. Esther. You may have wondered about this. Why was Esther not found at Qumran? The early rabbis were very worried about the book of Esther because there are some peculiar features of Esther. And some of you know these. Number one, the book of Esther is the only book that does not contain the name of God. The name of God is not found in Esther. And so maybe this was too secular a book. Maybe that's why it was left out. But there was a second problem with Esther, the problem of intermarriage with foreigners. You see, in the Bible, do Israelites ever marry foreigners? Of course they do. You know the story of um, Rahab the harlot, when the, the spies come into Jericho, remember that? And Rahab hides the spies, and then when Jericho is destroyed, she is saved because she's the one that said to the spies, your God will give the city into your hands. In other words, Rahab becomes part of the people of God because she accepts the God of Israel. 
There's another lovely story, the romance of Ruth. You know this very well. Ruth uh, and, and, and Orpah and, and the mother Naomi, they go to Moab and the men die and the old lady says, I'm going to return home. And she says to the girls, you are young, why don't you stay here in Moab, marry again and be happy. And Orpah says, that's a good idea. Let's go with that. But remember what Ruth says? She says, no. She says, where you go, I will go. Where you dwell, I will dwell. Um, um, your land will be my, your country will be my country, and your God will be my God. As, um, Ruth um, expresses faith in God. She comes back, she marries Boaz, and she becomes the ancestor of King David. So in the Bible, yes, people intermarry if they believe in God. But in the book of Esther, the queen uh, is married to the king. She's used to save the Jews from extinction by the wicked Haman. But there's no evidence that the king becomes a Jew. So some people worried about that. There's a third issue in the book of Esther, is the question of Purim. You all know the festivals, of course you do. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Most festivals come from the Torah. But Esther introduces a late festival called Purim. And in Israel today, they have a Purim play. It's a happy event. Well, at Qumran, um, they were a bit worried about this. Um, that that should, should Purim be regarded as a festival? And in fact, we now know that at Qumran, that uh, Esther, that, that, that this was the reason, there we are, Esther was excluded at Qumran. How do we know that? And there's one more slide. It is because um, the calendar texts. The calendar texts are very important. They list the festivals. They list the calendar. So we think Esther was not found at Qumran for a very diff a strong reason. Now, how does this, all this affect my Bible? You might say, Dr. Flint, this is very interesting, but how do the scrolls affect my Bible? The fact is, my friends, the biblical scrolls are up to 1,250 years older than the traditional Hebrew Bible. And you all know what that is, the Masoretic text. The Bible you use today in Hebrew is called the Masoretic text. This is the text of Scripture that was finalized by the Masoretes in the Middle Ages. Uh, this one here, I show you, is the Leningrad Codex, the oldest complete Hebrew Bible in the world. It's kept in Leningrad in Russia. Originally, it was made in Syria by Jews. Um, it's only kept in Russia. This is what is used for most Bible translations today. The other one I should mention is the Aleppo Codex, which is found in the Shrine of the Book, uh, many Jews believe that is even a more accurate Bible, but part of it is missing. It was destroyed in a fire. So this is the Masoretic text. It's shocking to know that these are about 1000 AD. The Aleppo Codex a bit earlier. Yes, your Bibles are all made from manuscripts about 1000 years old. But we believe our Bible is much more ancient. Until the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had nothing to prove it. We could pr believe it. We could discuss it. We had no evidence. Now we have scrolls that go back to 250 BCE. Let me share some of this powerful research I've done. Um, I've, I've been working on Isaiah for many years. Um, God gave me the grace to become the official editor of the great Isaiah scroll. I say this not to you in pride, but, but uh, basically for authority, that I speak with authority. That, that be, um, the, the, what you see in the museums are mounted by the museums, but it's the professors who, who publish them. And so I went to Israel many times to work on the great Isaiah scroll, and my work was very interesting. But I speak to you as the editor of the great Isaiah scroll. So let me take you to the shrine of the book again. Let's go behind the scenes. Let us go and, and look um, um, at the scrolls 
uh, where the public are not allowed. First of all, the Great Isaiah Scroll, the most famous of all the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is by God's providence and God's grace that I happened to be at Notre Dame and I studied what I did and I was able to become part of the story. When we talk about the scriptures, we believe God inspires scriptures, but also God takes care of scriptures. Let me put it this way. My old professor once said, it's not only God's inspiration, but God's care or God's protection of the scriptures. You see, our originals have all been lost. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found back in 1946 or 1947, things were very primitive. They too would have been lost. But there happened to be in Jerusalem at that time an American scholar, John Trevor, the first American ever to see the scrolls. He happened to be a photographic whiz. And he believed that it was important for him in those primitive days to take beautiful color pictures. That's his lab at the Asor building in East Jerusalem. Primitive conditions. And yet he made the most famous pictures, so famous we even used them for the edition. There's nothing better than the Trevor photographs. Um, I've just published these um, in, in a series called DJD. Uh, the official publication. I want to show this audience one slide that you'll think is rather interesting. These are digital photographs that we made at a high resolution. This is the great Isaiah scroll. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? These are, these are, these have been digitized. Uh, remember, this is 2,000 years old, read in natural light as if it were written yesterday. Most scrolls are not in this wonderful, pristine condition. Um, the other scroll that I was editing is called the Hebrew University Isaiah Scroll. This one you don't hear so much of, but it is very important. Look how black it was. How do we even read scrolls like that? Very, very difficult to the naked eye. But what has come to the rescue is um, different... Uh, parts of the light spectrum. In modern days, we have ultraviolet photography, we have infrared. Through these photographic techniques, we've been able to read the smaller Isaiah scroll, um, as you see on the right. In fact, most Dead Sea Scrolls, scholars are interested in the, in the infrared photographs. Usually, the surface is too black and too difficult. So there you see uh, on the right. We're interested in the script. We want to know what it says. Not exactly what it looks like. We want to know the message of the scrolls. This is from the edition. Um, let me take you into the vault where few men have ever trod. Let's go behind the scenes. Here I am. Um, and, um, I'm on the right. On the left is Professor Eugene Ulrich, editor-in-chief of the Biblical scrolls, and in the, in the center, Professor Adolfo Reutemann, curator of the Shrine of the Book. We are holding in our hands a 1200 DPI photograph of part of the Great Isaiah Scroll. You can tell from the shiny surface. But then uh, Professor Reutemann said, But you've come to see the original, have you not? I said, Yes, sir. He led me into the vault. Um, I kid you not with a guard, an armed guard at all times by my side. I was taken to the precious manuscript itself under tissue paper. And there's a picture that says a thousand words. On the left, the photograph. On the right, the precious scroll. So fragile, only one section could be read at a time. And then when that was done, I would proceed to the next part, the great Isaiah scroll itself. What an experience. Here's the picture I wanted to show this audience. I think you'd be interested. Do you see the lovely digitized image we managed to make from the Trevor photographs? But Trevor had taken a black and white set and he had taken a colored set. And it turned out for this particular column, column six, there was a tiny piece at the bottom. I will point it out to you. There was a tiny piece in black and white. 
In other words, the black and white photograph had a small piece that was not in the color. And so, actually, I had to graft or join the black and white piece onto the color photograph. So, you know, next time, you, if you see a, co a copy of this book, you must say to people, well, let me show you one of the color photographs that's got a black and white piece. That's something just insider knowledge. It's very interesting. Uh, that, that's how we had to publish that. Now, the point is, as I come to a close of this section, the scrolls confirm the accuracy of the biblical text. A lot of you may wonder, is my Bible accurate? Let us go to the great Isaiah scroll, and let us read these famous words um, from, from the book of Isaiah. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, and cry out to her that her bondage has ended. These are the lovely words uh, found in, in the book of Isaiah. Now, this is the great Isaiah scroll, and you might say, how does that relate to my Bible? Let us take the Masoretic text. Let us take the Masoretic text without vowels, and we'll lay them on top of each other and make a comparison. Remember, we were not able to do this until just a few years ago. When we compare this passage to the Masoretic text, what do we get? Well, we get about 10 differences, if you may see, in the yellow. There are a lot of differences there, and you might say, oh my, this means my Bible is riddled with mistakes. Well, in fact, these are all spelling. These are like American versus British spelling. The word color, C-O-L-O-U-R, C-O-L-O-R. Who's right? Both are right. The spelling does not count. In fact, in that one passage, there's just one real difference. Scholars now believe that the scrolls confirm that your Bible is accurate 99%. I better give you, as I close, a powerful reading from Isaiah, a new reading. Uh, someone mentioned to me earlier, you were looking at Isaiah 53. Now, I have to go rather fast, but you know the scripture very well. It's about the servant of the Lord, right? The man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. There is a puzzling verse uh, in this scripture, in verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's what the King James says. Why does the King James say that? Because it's translating the Masoretic text. The servant will see of the suffering of his soul he will be satisfied. Now, that's what it says. And the of gets in the way because, because it's in the Hebrew. Now, why is this translation so awkward? Scholars have wondered about this for a long time. Well, my friends, whatever your interpretation for Christians, this would be that the suffering servant, Jesus, dies and he's satisfied. There's no hint of something more. But when we turn to this passage in the, in the scrolls, I found in the great Isaiah scroll that there's a different reading. It does not say he shall see of the travail of his soul. There's the word light. Suddenly it bursts upon us. Um, out of the suffering of his soul, he will see light and find satisfaction. Wow. We have the glimpse of something more, the hint of new life the glimmer of resurrection. In other words, we've got the hint of Easter Sunday on Good Friday. The sermons will have to be re-preached and the books will have to be redone. There is the oldest reading of Isaiah 53. From the suffering of his soul, he will see light. Now, some of you might say, this Dr. Flint, he may have got the Essene fever. He's getting carried away. Maybe they were the children of light and they changed the text. So yes, let us be careful. Let's go to the great Isaiah scroll. He will see light. But let's go to another scroll. The Hebrew University Isaiah scroll. He will see light. And the only other scroll to have this chapter says, out of the suffering of his soul, he will see light. This reading is so powerful. It's coming back into modern Bible translations. My friends, I have to come to a close. 
My students have told me, always put this up. <clears throat> I have a, dead si a, a, a website, deadseascrolls.org. I'm going to now move in to the scrolls and the New Testament. This is uh, material, some of this you've not seen before. Um, I think you're going to find this very, very interesting. You see, these are not Christian scrolls. These are Jewish scrolls. Now, we've seen tonight that the scroll, Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered at Qumran mainly. We've talked about the great Isaiah scroll, the most famous of all the scrolls. We've surveyed cave number four and the 700 scrolls found there. We've also talked a little bit about the people who lived near at Qumran. Let's talk a little bit more about this community. You see, here we have the only archaeological site in Israel where we have manuscripts as well. What do we know about this community? The, the, Qumran is the only site in ancient Israel which yielded manuscripts from the Second Temple period. I need to mention that a lot of people don't know this. The archaeology and the scrolls can be studied together. Not so with a lot of archaeology. Here we have actual archaeology and scrolls. Uh, Father DeVoe, a famous figure, excavated Qumran back in the 1950s. How in the desert do you get water? I used to live in Arizona. One of the big problems in Arizona is where do you get water? And they bring it in from the north, do they not? Well, at Qumran, they didn't have any Canada to the north. They didn't have machines. They didn't have hydraulic pumps or even dams. How do you bring water to a community? We have the most amazing system of water channels found at Qumran. They needed water and they needed a lot of it. Here we see the huge cisterns that, were, that had water year round. Not only to drink, not only to sustain themselves, but they practiced baptism. Here is a mikvah, a very interesting mikvah. You know, when I first showed this slide, one person said, isn't that a pity the stairs got broken? Well, my friends, this is a wonderful picture because frozen in time, we have an event. You see, Josephus tells us in 31 BC, there was a huge earthquake in Judea. We believe that that um, split in the stairs was caused by that earthquake. This is 31 BC, this picture. We have stairs leading down into a pool. And in fact, we now know that at Qumran, they didn't only have ritual washing, they even had baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Here is a very important verse from the community rule. No one may enter the water unless he has repented of his evil, because uncleanness clings to all transgressors of his word. Baptism for the forgiveness of sin. Now, you may wonder who baptized them. Was it someone like John the Baptist? Someone like Jesus? Well, it's very interesting. You see, at Qumran, no one baptized them. The sinner would go, he would go down the stairs and plunge himself into the water, and he would rise from the water clean from his sins. And if you look very carefully in this slide, we actually have some rather strange rods or bars in the, going down. You can see them. They look like handles. The idea is you had a left lane and a right lane, something like the escalator at an airport, one way and another way. And the idea is that the sinner would go down on, on the one side, plunge himself into the waters of cleansing, he would emerge and go up by the other set of stairs. Isn't that interesting? The idea of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We also have a graveyard. Much could be said about the graveyard. I can tell you one thing, that the people were buried facing to the east so that on the resurrection day they would awaken to, to, to see the sunrise. Uh, we, we have the room where scrolls were copied. As I've mentioned already, we have the very means of production. 
so the archaeology is very, very interesting. Now I will proceed to say more about the non-Bible scrolls, which are very, very relevant for understanding Christian origins and messianic elements. How do the non-Bible scrolls relate to our understanding of Judaism and Christianity? Well, they record the ideas and outlook of the Qumran community. So what was their idea? What was their theology? How, what did they believe with respect to, to, the, to life and the afterlife and many issues? Well, here is one of them called the community rule. The community rule. Now, I've always had a problem explaining what this is. You see, this would be easy if I was at Notre Dame. Have you heard of the rule of St. Benedict? You see, Catholics are very used to monasteries, and they have a rule book uh, called the Rule, the Rule of St. Benedict or the Rule of St. Francis. Well, this community rule means it is like the rule book for the community. Here we have the first monastery in the Western world. Now, you might say, I didn't know Jews had monasteries. Yes, no less a person than Magen Broche, the first curator of the Dead Sea Scrolls, said this is the first monastery. Here, here was a group of Jews living out in the desert waiting for the end of the world, waiting for the Messiah, and this was their book of rules. Very interesting. Calendars. I could tell you so much about calendars. Did you know that in the Hebrew Bible there are two calendars of wo at work? There is the lunar calendar of 28 days, and there's the solar calendar of 30 days. These two calendars are seen in the Hebrew Bible. And sometimes, when there's been a, a contradiction in the text, it's actually two Bibles at work. At Qumran, they believed that the Jews of their time had got it wrong by taking on the lunar calendar from the Babylonians. They maintained that the true calendar was the solar calendar, and in fact, they may be right. There's evidence in the earlier scriptures that Jews practiced the solar calendar. It was in Babylon that they received the other one. And in fact, it's an important issue because the one who has the calendar sets the festivals, and the one that sets the festivals controls the religion. They believe that other Jews were out of fellowship with God through the wrong calendar. In fact, there's a lovely story. The high priest at Qumran, it was, a, it was, on, the, it was on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, a very sacred day. It, it is said that the other high priest in Jerusalem came to visit him on, on that day. In other words, he tried to mess up his, his Yom Kippur. Uh, if I may use an analogy, let's say the Greek Orthodox guy, uh, let's say you were angry with the Greek Orthodox person, and you know they have Christmas 10 days later than the other Christians. You know this, right? Let's just say you wanted to really upset the bishop and you sent a, a very important person to visit him on his Christmas. That, that happened at Qumran. That in fact, that they were disturbed, uh, what they call the, the, the wicked priest coming to visit them um, on a crucial time. I'm being a bit involved now, but calendars is a very big issue in the scrolls. The copper scroll, the only document that is written on copper from the ancient world, talks about buried treasure enough to make us rich. How does this impact our understanding of the New Testament? The Dead Sea Scrolls are essential reading. I'm going to maintain to you tonight that the Dead Sea Scrolls are essential reading for a number of issues. Number one, the Dead Sea Scrolls are essential reading for our understanding of the Old Testament Scripture in the New Testament. Okay? The use of the Old Testament in the New. Now, we've already seen that the three favorite books in the New Testament were Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and the Psalms, and they were among the first, first four at Qumran. Remember, we've got at Qumran, number four, Isaiah, number two, Deuteronomy, number one, the Psalms. Let's talk about Deuteronomy first. Let me do that. What was the reason why the early Christians quoted Deuteronomy so much and why the people at Qumran, the, the Essenes, the Yachad, 
why did they love the book of Deuteronomy? There's a key word. It's, it's Moses, it's the law, but there's a key word. And this is it, covenant. You see, for the Christians, Jesus takes the bread and the wine. He says, this is my blood of the new covenant. Did you know that the people of Qumran, they didn't call themselves Essenes. They didn't even call themselves Jews. What was their name for themselves? Well, one of their names was the Sons of Light, right? But their other name was the Community of the New Covenant. Wow, there is an amazing hit with the New Testament. Both were bringing in a new covenant. Number two, um, the book of Isaiah. Why is Isaiah so prominent at Qumran and in the New Testament? In other words, we're looking at a sort of parallel convergence. Why is Isaiah so important for the, the Yachad and in the New Testament? The key word is Messiah. Yes. Messianic. Here were Jews, Messianic Jews, living out in the desert, waiting for the end of time. They were not Yeshua. They weren't a Christian Messianic Jews, but they believed, in fact, in two messiahs. Very interesting. Now, the book of Psalms. Why was the book of Psalms so big in the New Testament and at Qumran? What's the key word? And I battled with this because the Psalms is so rich. Right? Psalms is about prayer and praise and kingship, is it not? Messianic. The key word is David. You get it? It took me five years, and my, one of my students said, Dr. Flint. See, I used to say the Psalms, there's two words. There is Messiah and there's prayer. And my students said, Dr. Flint, I've got it. It's David. See that? The, the word that put, brings it together. So this is very important. The same books. Um, look at there. We have the commentary on Nahum. We have the first commentaries ever written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They loved Scripture. The book of Enoch. Some of you may know that the book of Jude quotes from the prophet Enoch. Enoch was a big book at Qumran. Very popular. Very important. Some even think that, that it was a sort of Enochic Judaism found um, among the Yachad. Now let's talk about essential reading for New Testament messianic expectation. These uh, here were Jews living out in the desert before the Christians. They expected Messiah, and in fact they expected more than one Messiah. Here we have the community rule that's come up a lot. Let's take this key verse. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Right? You know John the Baptist is connected with that verse. Well, here was a group in the desert, quoting from Isaiah, uh, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, waiting for the Messiah. They did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. Actually, they had other Messiahs, but the idea of a common messianic expectation. Let me share with you a powerful reading from the Psalms. Someone here tonight told me they love the Psalms. Well, listen to this. Here's a very controversial reading. If you go to the King James, um, there's a reading in the book of Psalms that is very important. I've, I've checked this out when I was working on the Psalm scrolls. I went to the Rockefeller Museum into the basement to check on the Psalm scrolls, and I found something very interesting. Folks, I did my PhD on the Psalms, and there I am some years ago um, as a younger man. I'm holding in my hands the oldest copy of the book of Psalms in the world, 150 BCE. I've often been asked, what was it like <clears throat> to touch the Psalm scroll? My friends, it's like reaching out and touching the very hand of God. It is a mystical experience. And you know, when we professors get old, and we are in a small room, maybe with our wives, right? And our kids get rid of all our books. That's what professors all fear. And I'm going to say to my grandchildren, I want to tell you something. In my life, I touched the Psalm scroll. It is that precious. Well, I didn't just show you this tonight to show you a scroll. There's powerful message in these. 
Psalm 22 says this. It's a very famous psalm. You know this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's quoted in the New Testament more than any other psalm. They've cast lots for my clothing. Now, in verse 10, it says this in the King James. Dogs have surrounded me. A pack of evil ones closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Now, many Christians have said, well, that's quite obvious. That's a picture of the crucifixion. And you might say that's good, but you would be shocked to find that your Bible does not say that. Um, if you go to the Masoretic text, uh, we, we, we have a different way. We have ka ka'ari. A pack of evil ones closes in on me like a lion on my hands and feet. And if you were to ask many people, why does the King James say they have pierced my hands and feet? They would say, because they're trying to Christianize that psalm. They are cheating, they're changing the difficult reading like a lion on my hands and feet. So my friends, this is a crucial reading. Does Psalm 22 say, they have pierced my hands and feet, or does it say, like a lion? I've checked this out. There's only one scroll that, uh, that has this reading. In fact, there are three scrolls, a new one just came to light. There are three scrolls that have Psalm 22. There's only one scroll, the psalm scroll from Nachal Chever, and I've checked it out personally. And when you turn to the relevant verse, what do we find? There it is, um, Ka'aru. They have pierced my hands and feet. I have just shared with you dynamite. I've shared with you a reading that generations of scholars have said had been changed to they have pierced my hands and feet. Now we get the most ancient copy of the psalm and what does it say they have pierced my hands and feet and it's back in most modern bibles so the king james got it right they didn't have the scrolls but folks this is a very very important reading and if you go on the internet you will find there's a lot of discussion about it now the dead sea scrolls are essential for understanding jesus a messianic son of god in the scrolls Right, so when I went to study at university, I was told, you know, the idea of a messianic son of God is something late. This is not from Judaism. You know, in, in Luke 1, the angel says to Mary, uh, he will be great. He will be called the son of the Most High. And at the end, he'll be called the son of God. The idea would be that this is a Christianizing later edition that the Jews don't talk about a messianic son of God. Well, we now have a scroll from Qumran written in Aramaic. It's not a biblical scroll. It talks about a coming figure, a messianic figure, and it has that same language. He will be called the son of God. They will, they will call him the son of the Most High. It's just a, a one-line coincidence, but... Uh, the idea of a messianic son of God is known in Judaism, but had been lost to us. What about did Jesus claim to be the Messiah? Did Jesus claim to be the Messiah? Now you might say, oh please, doesn't this guy know anything? Well folks, if you, if you um, look in the New Testament, Jesus very seldom says, I am the Messiah. I'm going to take you to Luke. He comes to Nazareth. And he turns to the book of Isaiah, and it says here, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. Now I have a number of bullets. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has he's anointed me, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so we are told in Luke that when he read this, everybody was just amazed. And Christians have always said, well, Jesus is claiming to be Messiah. I was quite shocked when I was in PhD studies and I had professors saying, that's not possible. Jesus never claimed to be Messiah. Luke made it up and put it in his mouth. Well, now we have a scroll called the Messianic Apocalypse from K4, 4Q521. And this is not a biblical scroll. It's BCE, it's not a Christian scroll, and it uses the word Messiah. 
heaven and earth will listen to his Messiah. And it gives you a number of things that are going to happen when the Messiah comes. All right, setting the captives free, opening the eyes of the blind, raising up the oppressed. And what this all is boiling down to is that if you study this in contrast to Luke, Jesus is drawing on a tra tradition that's already there. It's not the church making it up. Jesus is claiming to be Messiah because we have a number of hits that correspond between Luke and the scroll, and the word Messiah is used. We've got the clear claim to be messianic on the part of Jesus. It's not the church making it up. Now you might say, what does it all mean? Well, Jesus is claiming to be a prophetic Messiah. That's what's happening in Luke. In Luke 4, Jesus is saying, I am a prophetic Messiah. Now you might say, okay, I know a lot of people who accept that, but there's one part that I don't like, this idea of the dead being raised. Dan Brown and others would say in the Da Vinci Code, this has all been made up. Please, Jews never talked about the dead being raised. Right? And the, the idea is, is controversial. Um, if, 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 you, if you look in Luke, Jesus doesn't only say the blind receive their sight. Uh, this is Luke 7. And John the Baptist wants to know, are you the Messiah? And he says, tell John what you've seen. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead people are being raised. The poor have got good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense. So Jesus is saying, look at these things that have happened. Uh, you, want, you want to know if I'm the Messiah? And the difficulty is scholars would say we have no evidence that Jews were talking like that. Well, I'll go back to the same scroll. See, some scholars say resurrection's not found. And there's lots of them who think that way, especially New Testament scholars. Let's go back to our scroll because it not only talks about what we've said already, it says he will heal the wounded, he will revive the dead, he will bring good news to the poor. My friends, this is an explosive scroll. This is the most important scroll relating to messianism. It affirms what Luke is claiming about Jesus. Do you know about the works of the law? If you've looked at Paul in the New Testament, there's actually a really difficult section where Paul uses a term, works of the law. Right? Again and again, he brings up this works of the law. Modern Bibles change it to deeds of the law. What is he saying? Well, Paul says, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified since through the law comes knowledge of sin. It's to do with the relationship between the New Testament church and Judaism. We hold that no one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Do you need to practice halakha and halachot um, as a Christian? What, what is this about? Then Paul goes on to say in Galatians, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. It is, it is written, cursed be anyone who does not abide by all things in the law and do them. Now this is known to us. Now some would say this is quite simple. Paul is proclaiming the gospel of grace, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, against Judaism, which is based on the works of the law. And many have, been, have come up with all sorts of ideas, even anti-Semitism with thinking like that. But let's look at this again. However, there are examples in the Hebrew Bible of people being saved by God's grace. Of course there are. There are many passages in the Scriptures. The Lord passed before Moses and he said, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. We have many references to the, the grace, the mercy of God in the scriptures. So the idea of Judaism being a religion of works only seems to miss the point. What is Paul really trying to say in Romans and Galatians? Well, we now have a, a very interesting text from Qumran called 4QMMT, a miskat ma'asei ha-Torah, some of the works of the law. So that's the, the Hebrew in English. 4QMMT uh, is a document that has miskat ma'asei ha-Torah, 
or some of the precepts of Torah. So this is very interesting. What about the law? There are three sections. It has a 364-day solar calendar. According to this document, a true believer has to follow this, this calendar, the longer calendar. And then there are 24 religious laws or halachot and an epilogue on the separation of the group from those who disagree. So this is who are the true Jews? That's what this is all about. Um, works of the law, it turns out, is only found in this document and in Paul. If you take a search of ancient literature, the works of the law is a unique term that's found in Romans, Galatians, and MMT, nowhere else. Why is this? We have written to you some of the works of the law, those which we determined would be beneficial for you and your people. And it will be reckoned to you as righteousness in that you have done what is right and good before him to, to um, your own benefit and to that of Israel. So the idea of works of the law is a, an Essene or a Qumranic type doctrine. And so we now think, scholars now believe that works of the law is found elsewhere only at Qumran. Because of that, in the passages from Romans and Galatians, Paul is really arguing against Essene Jews or Christians who've been influenced by their teachings. In other words, Paul is not condemning Judaism as such. It's a certain flavor of Judaism. It is Essene uh, Judaism. So the idea that, that we need to remember that Qumran is in the background of much of the New Testament if we want to understand it properly. I'm going to have to come to a close. The last one as we close. The Battle of Armageddon. Right? Battle of Armageddon. We've heard so much about this in the book of Revelation. They came to the place that is in Hebrew called Armageddon. That's all we get in Revelation. And yet there have been movies about the final battle at the end of time. Well, did you know that we now have a whole scroll? In fact, there's several copies of it about the eschatological battle at the end of time. It's called the war scroll between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Very important scroll. It is the battle of Armageddon. The sons of light and the forces of darkness will fight together to show the strength of God with the roar of a great multitude and the shouts of gods and men. A day of disaster. This is a quotation from the scroll. The two sides are tied at three rounds each. In three rounds, the sons of light will stand firm so as to strike a blow at wickedness. And three rounds, the army of Belial, the devil, will strengthen themselves so as to force the retreat of the sons of light. See, here we have a great contest in seven rounds. They are tied at three each. And now we come to the final battle, the Battle of Armageddon, in the War Scroll. And folks, we even have archaeological evidence that confirms that there was a battle tower found at Qumran. Arrowheads were found there. On a day in 68 CE, the Romans attacked. The sons of light gathered in their white robes. They took up their, their weapons. They waited for the angels from heaven to join them to defeat the, the sons of darkness. Their dream did not come true. The Romans destroyed them. The idea of the eschatological battle remains true. Their, 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 their Messiah, their interpretation turned out not to work. But this gives strong confirmation to what is happening in the book of Revelation. I have much to say about the New Jerusalem. I can't tell you about this now. There's a New Jerusalem scroll. Let me come to the end. So I've, I've said enough. Thank you, everybody. A big hand.